Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. <laughs> what do you call a boy band made up of misogynist men? I don't know, Anna, what do you call a boy band made up of misogynist men? The Spice Girls. I, <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Intro music. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And this is Liliana's pre-read media take. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about the Bob's Burgers episode, Boys for Now. <sighs> and I genuinely checked like 15 minutes ago what the name, the German name of the episode was, and it was the same. It's a Boys for Now. <laughs> yeah. Right. So first, because we've never talked about Bob's Burgers before, Bob's Burgers is an animated, and I looked this up, was is considered an adult animation show. Because we talked about that, like how we're not sure that whether that's like an adult or mm. teenage or in between. Yeah. And it was first shown with The Simpsons and Family Guy on the Sunday night lineup on Fox. It was called Animation Domination in 2011. And it's created by Lauren Bouchard, who also developed Central Park and The Great North. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about boys for now, yeah. and I'm going to read a summary that I tried to write about the episode. <laughs> so Aunt Gail uh, has gotten Louise and Tina tickets for a boys for now concert, and while Tina's really excited, Louise is dreading going. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jean has reached the regionals in tablescaping, not table setting, uh, and his parents accompany him. I swear to God. Oh, yeah, sorry In case that. you're hearing that, that's a plane. Yeah. I was like, this is a weirdly weird thunder, and I was like, because it's, <laughs> Cause it's not thunder. <laughs> yeah, so, tablescaping. Yes. Which I looked up, and that is a real thing. Oh, it is a real thing? Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> I kind of love the fact that, like, there's, like, regionals and nationals and, like, international... Yeah, I don't know how... Like, I looked up, like, children's tablescaping competitions. Okay. And they, nothing came up for that, but there were tablescaping competitions, so. I can just see them in the writer's room, someone being like, there's this thing called tablescaping, we need to put that in yeah, an episode. <laughs> It's like a good subplot. Like, yes, it is. It's, it's better than like in um, the Silence of Louise episode with the inspirational posters. That's yeah. a bit. Yeah. Although that is, seems to be like a huge industry, which yeah. is kind of I understand like why they were like maybe this is interesting, <laughs> but like, table setting was yeah. way more fun. I think maybe watching it the first time round it's fine, but then when you rewatch the episode a few times, we were originally going to do up this episode on the Silence of Louise. Yes. And then change to voice for now because it's more to talk about. But yeah, we just watched it a few times. It's like, the, yeah, the, the subplot with the, yeah. Maybe also the main plot yeah. is too strong or something. Yeah, yeah. Because it's got it a lot going quite... on. <laughs> yeah, with this one, they're quite well matched. Whereas, yeah, with the um, Silence of the Wii's, it's sort of like, yeah, you've got the kind of really fun, the fun detective plot with like, yeah, like yeah. it's really intense. And then like inspirational posters. And you're like, why am I listening to this? And Gail then calls them and tells them that she, uh, she mistook her cat for an intruder and pepper sprayed the cat and she cannot bring the girls to the concert. Uh, Louise feels sorry for Tina, which I thought was really touching. Yeah. <laughs> she's a good sister. Yeah. And she promises she's going to get her to the venue. Yes. And they try to bike to the venue, <laughs> but ultimately are taken by Zeke and his cousin and they're, who are both there to sell bootleg t-shirts and hot dogs. When the concert starts, Louise mocks the other girls there, but falls for Boo Boo as soon as he enters the stage. He's one of the boy band members. And then she runs to the bathroom and tries to calm down, but ultimately decides she has to get backstage to slap Boo Boo in the face, which is her reaction to having a crush. <laughs> And at the tablescaping competition, Bob and Linda become comp competitive because another dad is really competitive. And they urge Jean to win, even though they were sort of just there for like the participation yeah. trophy, essentially. <laughs> Jean, however, did not prepare a second table because he, uh, he had to prepare two tables, which he did not realize because he didn't read the rules. <laughs> and they dump out Linda's bag to like, find stuff and they only found tampon products and strawberry jam <laughs> and so they create this table called the men's trond or a period piece which is actually a really like it looked really good it's it was like awesome <laughs> creative resourceful i thought it was more interesting than like in the maryland thing yeah I, I quite like the maryland one like there's basically in the episode there's like um I know a kind of bust of like Marilyn Monroe with like baguettes for arms and then they sort of like have the tablecloth um, and they put like a fan under the tablecloth so it, like, oh there was a like, reference I didn't yeah, catch so that I was like why is it waving and I was yeah. like oh that's oh yeah I'm such an idiot yeah that's such well, a Marilyn. famous thing too from that movie even though I've never seen that film I've never seen that film <laughs> maybe next film next film yes maybe. yeah 
Which I'm one not sure is which that? one that is. I really want to. Oh, is yeah. it like the seventh year or something? I don't. I don't know Marilyn Monroe films. The seven year itch or something. Ah, I've heard of. Yeah. Might it be that one? That I'm sounds... not sure. <laughs> On an episode of Sewing Bee, they had to like sew the Marilyn dress. I love Sewing Bee. Oh, I nice. really want to watch it. It's so good. Listen, BBC, make things more easily available in Germany. It's really annoying that I have more access to American shows than I do to British ones. It's really annoying. And I love Cho Lysett. Let me watch Sewing Bee. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> anyway. Um, he ends up not winning the regionals with this, which... Robbed. It's disgusting. Like, it was so fun. Also, he used the tampons as candles and, like, the... Yeah, like the centipedes. <laughs> like... And he used the strawberry jam as the one. <laughs> Uh, and then he off put the the pad the napkin on her lap. Yeah. He like he offered to like put the pad. It's got wings. <laughs> it does, you have to catch any spill. <laughs> so good. Oh, and Louise and Tina, meanwhile, they actually managed to sneak on the tour bus and hide in the boys' hamper. Which honestly, the first time I watched, it, I was like, "This is so gross." But Tina is so into the smells. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just stay here forever. Yeah, they are ultimately discovered, and Louise manages to fulfill her dream and slaps Boo Boo in the face, and they are thrown off the bus. <laughs> uh, and Gail drives them home. They call Aunt Gail, and she drives them home. And Louise slaps a picture of Boo Boo <laughs> before falling asleep, and she's now finally a fangirl herself. Oh, it's so, oh, it's so heartwarming. I love it's it so, so much. Sweet. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe we should say Every cursing on this episode is going to be my reaction to mosquitoes. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to start off now talking about um, animation, comedy, and intertextuality. Because I read a whole, a whole little chapter of a book by Sam Summers on DreamWorks Animation. Um, I read Why is Shrek Funny, DreamWorks, and it's then the intertextual so gag. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I need to stop that. Um, and basically, I mean, I, I am not slapping Lily or Boo Boo. I'm just slapping mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, I'm so the sorry. slap sounds like very, yeah, very appropriate for this episode. <laughs> But yeah, um, because again, we were going to um, originally talk about Silence of Louise and there's like a lot of intertextual stuff in that. However, there's still, it's still interesting, I think, it talks about in the article, basically what Sam Summers talks about in his book, DreamWorks Animation, is kind of looking at CGI as like a kind of more realistic version of like cartoons, which I think kind of relates to Bob's book. We'll talk, maybe talk about this a bit, in a bit more, but kind of because CGI isn't the same as like a kind of old style cartoons, it's like more realistic and basically he argues that like comedy comes from this sort of like breaking of the like the illusion of reality and so when you make something look artificial you, you're wrenched out of that illusion of reality and it kind of makes that ridiculous and it's something that you can laugh at and it kind of comic or yeah cartoons especially kind of show like the ridiculousness of the idea of stability and kind of old style comics or cartoons sorry i keep saying comics i mean cartoons like that stability was like the idea of like the laws of like physics or whatever you'd have someone like walk off a cliff and like not fall off that cliff and then fall off that cliff you know or like they sort of play with or like someone's head would blow up but then the next scene they're fine that kind of thing whereas with he was, he was very argues, brutal yeah <laughs> yeah i know like looney tunes is like pretty it's like yeah it's I quite violent get a clips of it but it's a lot of like have you only seen clips of looney tunes yeah i've never oh, seen looney tunes it's not i've a seen a lot of like i mean i'm Again, I wasn't allowed to watch TV, so that's mm -hmm. the reason. But Sorry, like, I forget, yeah. No, no, no. I just remember a lot of people being hit in the head with an anvil. Yeah, Which always. is such a weird thing to, like, hit someone with. Yeah, but exactly. Like, it's like someone gets hit on the head with an anvil, but they're fine. Or, like, yeah. Lots of kind of stuff where it's playing with, like, the kind of physical elements or, like, the visual elements of the cartoon. Because like, you can do that with it's cartoons. It's very over the, to over the top. Yeah. Whereas Sam Summers argues that with CGI... Um, basically, you laugh at the notion of stability, but within the narrative. And what DreamWorks does is they use intertext to destabilize the idea of like a kind of stable world. Um, so they'll like make in Shrek, they'll like make jokes about like Shirley Bassey or something, and be like, "That bush looks like Shirley Bassey." And it's like the joke is the kind of like that can't exist in this Shrek universe because it's sort of like fairy tale and folk, but it kind of it still does. Like this character still exists there, so that just sort of like subverts the or like again wrenches you out of that illusion of reality. And you're kind of, but like using the narrative rather than using like visual effects. Such an interesting reference because I'm sure like a lot of people just don't know who that is. I did. I never got that reference. It was in Shrek Two, and I was <laughs> always just like, what? But like, again, here's the thing. Like the idea that like um, animation is like written just for children or like animation yeah, is made for children point. has like never really been true. Yeah, that's like, very true. Sam Summers says that like um, kind of golden age cartoons were basically. Oh yeah, so. This is a quote. Golden Age cartoons were designed to be exhibited alongside live action features aimed at a diverse age range. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so basically you always get like in like animation, you, like even animation aimed at children, you get so many like adult jokes because they know that like parents are going to be watching this with their children and like, or that's what you have now and like back in the day you just have it shown alongside like a diverse range of things so it needed to like appeal to lots of different audiences, I think, from that's what I got from this article. No, I think that's really yeah. important because a lot of children's media is always considering the fact that some parent usually sits next to the child having to watch this mm. and trying to make it at least a little bit entertaining for them as well. Which is why Shirley Bassey yeah. <laughs> joke like does make sense. But there's like a um, in Ratatouille. There's like I'd never picked up on this, mm -hmm. but there's like a moment where he goes, "I've got a little," and like is like pointing to the rat that's in his pants or something. Uh, yeah. And she just sort of looks down for a sec. What is he telling me? <laughs> but because it was sort of made also so the parents would maybe let the kid keep watching too, mm. not just be like, "This is stupid. Let's turn this off." Yeah, it's the same thing with like advert. I guess. Kind of the opposite with like advertising it's like they have like really catchy like sort of jingles so that like kids will remember them and like oh, good point. sing them at the adults and so it's sort of like aimed at the adults but also aimed at the children in order to annoy the adults into like buying them the thing or like buying i don't know car insurance whatever okay bringing it back to bob's burgers so if we look at like the idea of like realism in cartoons and cgi kind of not going into the um breaking the stability through visual effects bob's burgers is quite a similar even though it is more of a cartoony style it's also very realistic in many ways. It doesn't, you don't have people's heads exploding. You, like, there's kind of very kind of stable rules within this universe. It's kind of quite like our, like, you know, people don't, like, fall off cliffs in yeah. interesting ways. It's like the rules of, like, like um, rules of physics and stuff all kind of make sense. They set yeah. some very specific boundaries within, like, what's possible in yeah. the world. And it's not quite, it's not quite like um, our world because it is more exaggerated. It does have dancing um, yeah. seedlings. It has dancing, oh that's such a good <laughs> episode as well. We're talking about... Um, where um, Bob has a garden, I don't remember where... Um, I think the German title was like, yeah, Bob has a garden. Or was Bob's it? Gardens. I can't God, that's horrible. <laughs> The song um, is he sings about being a British lady in his garden. And sweet peas and green beans. <laughs> it's a dream come true. I don't know if we can have this. Would that be a copyright strike if I start I singing this? I think it's this? way too short, honestly. Okay, we're fine. We're fine. We won't get copyrighted. It's fine. But yeah, yeah. Like they, they do sometimes like um, burst into like musical numbers, and you have like that kind of breaking the fourth wall. Yes, breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Diegetic stuff. And then you also have stuff like. Um, but only in like very specific segments. Mm, yeah. yeah they limit it a lot yeah and you also have stuff like everything's i think everything is very like it's very everyday yes but it's also very bizarre and like so the everyday is made bizarre and the bizarre is made every day um and so you've got like you know like louise who is like still like a little girl but she's also you know she she swear i mean she doesn't like really go all out swearing like you could definitely see louise going all out swearing but she kind of like she says like crap and like oh friggin whatever yeah yeah or freaking yeah yeah and she she's has, quite extreme <laughs> she's she's very extreme and again that's kind of like this is like a kind of exaggerated version yeah. like that's not like quite real life but it never takes you out I've, i don't think i've ever seen an episode where louise becomes so out of touch mm. where i feel like it's left the world of the show yeah so they are quite careful i think to like not leave the yeah the limit limitations the limit, yeah the limitations yeah, the that they set for the show like reality like you said like it doesn't ever sort of go into like someone chops someone's head off and then it's just yeah. sort of didn't they happen they don't like yeah become cannibals at any point <laughs> in the actual <laughs> which was the in which was interestingly in case you're just watching the uh, listening to us now the initial under uh, like idea for the show was that it was meant to be about cannibals which is why the first episode is called human flesh like it was about the, the, the idea the that family, they actually like, make <laughs> made burgers out of humans yeah. Which is, yeah. They also looked a lot more weird. Did they? The design, yeah. The, the, like the noses went over. Like if you notice, like the um, noses are just sort of like this like little, line down. Yeah, and up. Little, the yeah. noses in the original like went over the mouths. Like they were longer than the mouths oh. if you like saw it in profile. Oh, yeah, that's a little yeah. bit strange. Yeah, it looks very different. Ooh. Also, we've talked about this before. It's just a side note. I like in terms of the expertise and the skill of it, I find it amazing. But I just personally, maybe because of the comic books I grew up with, I just prefer lines and then filled color in them. I don't know why, <laughs> but just everything to CGI always freaks yeah, me out. Uh, I just prefer old school. I, yeah, same. Like black lines around every single I part. I love like a thick line. Yeah, yeah, I love a thick line. Yeah, I really, I do like the art style of Bob's Burgers as well. Like it's just so iconic. You're like, you're watching, you're like, yeah, this is Bob's Burgers. Like yeah. it's just, yeah, it's very friendly. Yeah, so um, I watched the you know, uh, the Comic Con panel from San Diego because uh, this year we didn't have to pay for it because of COVID. Hooray! 
I just wanted to sort of take notes on what they said about the album coming out in August and the movie and like everything that they said. Uh, the movie is pretty much done in terms of the recording, but they're Ooh. still like producing the whole thing. Lauren Bouchard, the showrunner, said they keep wanting to make more small stories feel big, which you also what you said about sort of ah, making the everyday yes. feel extraordinary. Yeah, feel like bizarre. Bizarre. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I mean extraordinary also works, but like yeah. yeah, I guess it's more kind of just like weird, like yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Also, they apparently made a short before COVID hit, was called My Butt Has a Fever, which they haven't recorded a single line of yet, but it's completely written and stuff. Oh. So it was sort of like done in a Ooh. way, but then because of COVID, everything sort of got shifted. Mm -hmm. It was also meant to be released in theaters <laughs> and they made uh, a whole feature film, which he said that they definitely want to release in theaters because it's just not going to be only a digital release. Mm -hmm. Also, he said that the genre is going to be a musical, comedy, mystical adventure coming of age. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Yes. Very postmodern. He also talked about the idea of uh, that they try to break the rules that they said in the beginning every season a little bit. Ooh. Um, Ooh. Did he give an example? Uh, if you've ever read anything about sort of how like screenwriting works, they mm. usually tell you a uh, show don't tell. Like, show the the character evolving. Don't just have other characters point out that the characters evolved. Mm -hmm. It's just much more interesting to see it for yourself and then have sort of that story taking place in your own brain as opposed to just everybody just telling you everything yeah, that's going on still, yeah and he said that the whole rule of the show actually in the writer's room from the beginning was tell don't show and i think that's kind of interesting because in animation everything that's drawn there feels so ex uh, like intentional mm -hmm. so maybe like showing me something is going to be way more on the nose than telling me something yeah it's really interesting. Yeah. And I guess, did it? Did he mean tell, don't show as in like the character? Because I don't think it's just like the characters tell you what to think. It's, it's yeah, it's more like the voices. Like you said that like um, they wrote it so that it would almost seem like a podcast. Like Yeah, like can, it could be, it could yeah. be consumed like a podcast. Yeah. And what was interesting, Kristen Shaw, who plays Louise, brilliantly, I love her so much. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> she said that it's, she sort of said it like a little bit like complainingly. They're like, this is how everybody watches everything anyway. Like, like no one pays attention. Everybody's on their phone the entire time. <laughs> I thought that's kind of brilliant. And maybe that's also why the show is like very yeah. successful. Because maybe a lot of people do sort of watch it on the side. It's and, like, perfect binging. Yeah. yeah. Because it's been going on for 10 years. And I honestly I was aware of it on Tumblr and stuff, but mm. I wasn't aware of it on any other level. Yeah, same, same. Yeah. And so I just started watching randomly and then I was I actually like, after a couple of episodes I was like, I love this so much. <laughs> yeah, but I just thought it was interesting in terms of how stories are told within animation mm. that they don't follow this rule at all. Like this idea of just sort of showing you what's happening as opposed to telling you. Yeah. And also a lot of the comedy, we talked about this as well, is like when something extraordinary happens or something leaves the logic of mm -hmm. like the scene, you see the other characters and just stand around and have very deadpan, yeah. like no reaction. And Which is also why it's so funny. Yeah. Well. <laughs> it just looks so like done with everyone, like yeah. constantly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, that ties back into the idea of using narrative to like break the fourth wall and like, uh, yeah, kind of create the comedy rather than like visual effects. Because, yeah, you, you don't get kind of ex extreme visual effects, particularly in Bob's Burgers, although you do get some. But, like, yeah, if it's And focused... also, if you do get mm -hmm. them, they're going to be, like, have more way more of an effect. Like, yes. Louise in this episode is way more animated than she usually is. Mm. Yeah, that kind of shot of her, like, pulling down her bunny ears <laughs> and just screaming. Yeah. Yeah. That's so lovely. It's so lovely. <laughs> yeah. You can get away with so much more in animation because it's... You've got that kind of disconnect from the real world as well. Um... I don't know, I just watched one where like the kids start like selling weed like Oh yeah, start. that's a good one. <laughs> really good. Gonna talk about this later with Tina as well. Any kind of discussion of kids' sexual awakening because she's a teenager, mm. this is so much more possible to talk about in an animation. Yeah. Because you're not sexualizing a real child behind the camera at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Because this is completely fake. Yeah, she's like a cartoon child and also she's voiced by an adult person. Adult man. Yeah. No disrespect to Dan Mintz, he's brilliant. Oh, he's I brilliant. love I love his yeah. performance. It's so good. Yeah. Many of you might be aware of the terms diegetic and non-diegetic. Or, yeah, diegetic and non-diegetic. Yes. Um, so, and in case you're not, it's not too complicated. It's like yeah. a baseline. Mm -hmm. So diegetic is when the sound exists within the like world of the characters. Yeah. yeah. For example, if there's like a band in the background that's playing music and you can hear that over the dialogue, it's the band is like in the scene. Yeah. The characters are aware of this band. Yeah. I just think of that scene like in... 
I think it was because it was in like a Witch Please episode where they talk about um, the scene in Prisoner of Azkaban where Lupin like plays the like funky jazz track when they're like oh, doing the, point, and yeah. that's like diegetic sound and then like the sound the kind of when I don't know one of the the bogart turns into something a kind of like woo like kind of scary music comes in when the score like starts yeah the score and stuff like that that's not part of the scene and the characters can't hear it that is non diegetic sound yes yeah but then we discovered upon <laughs> reading a bit of Sam Summers um, his introduction um, that there's like different subcategories of diegetic and non diegetic sound um, a lot of them which makes sense actually and I mean yeah. you can broadly just group them into diegetic and non-diegetic from what it looks like diegetic and non-diegetic are two, the two basic ones that, yeah. yeah just think diegetic is like a person like in the background non-diegetic means that you as an audience are aware yeah. of the sound but not the characters yes the sync of swelling music and dramatic is about to happen and you just you know the characters themselves don't hear that score yeah it's the background music that you wish was happening in your life you hear. <laughs> if someone was Very watching true. the show of your life and it would be way more dramatic <laughs> Yeah, oh, I wish. I wish. <laughs> Yesterday would have been very sort of 1950s, just like me falling in the lake, just like dun dun oh, yeah. dun. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, last night I was like, Anna, do you want to go for a midnight swim? Because we live really near a lake. And you were like, yeah, that sounds fun. And so we walked down there and it's very dark. Yeah. Um, and we're like, uh, we just about managed to get down to like the like um, shoreline of the lake. Yeah. And you're like, oh, is it like we get in here like is are you sure it's like you know shallow, shallow. And i was like yeah i'm pretty sure it's shallow like this looks pretty like yeah i'm pretty sure like i think it's fine and i stuck my toe in thinking it was gonna be like maybe five centimeters deep and then i just sort of didn't feel the ground and i was like oh you know like don't be like scared don't be a coward and then just like went top over <laughs> it's just like it was like a meter deep it was like quite scary to just see you like <laughs> submerged i was like oh god i've killed anna <laughs> Like, are you okay? And he started laughing. I was like, is that a good sign? Are you in shock? And then you were so concerned. I was like, no, 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 please don't be upset. Please don't be upset. Like, it's fine. Yeah. And we were being so quiet as well because there was no one around. Well, that wasn't until later anyway. But like, yeah, it was very quiet. And we were like, we don't want to like disturb anyone or the animals. And yeah, then, like... let them like sleep in peace. And then just like the loud version of that. Unless I would have, what's it called? Like a... Cannonball? Cannonball, like What's into... that in German again? That's like, it's like Arschbomber or something like that. Is that Arschbomber, Arsch oh yeah. Oh, sorry, I love that so much. <laughs> I haven't used that term since I was like 10. I was like, what are you talking about, ass? <laughs> yeah, it's called ass bomb. Yeah. <laughs> nice. You're learning the important vocabulary, yes. that's good. <laughs> I'm ATU German now. Um, what are we talking about? Diegetic. Diegetic, yeah. So, yeah. so diegetic would have been if um, the sound, like the the sound I was splashing. making, yeah. if I would have started singing yeah. or something. And non-diegetic is like the score that would have played in the background of just me doing dun, dun, the dun. most slapstick, <laughs> basic, oh, just fall yeah. into, yeah, exactly, <laughs> into the water. Oh. And just important to know that it's meant to just keep you in the world of the movie the entire mm -hmm. time. You're experiencing the sound of the movie the way that the characters would as well. Yeah. And the more it's non-diegetic, the more you sort of get more of like a full round experience, which mm -hmm. just has different different tools of storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. We talked a bit earlier about um, animation, the idea that animation is children's media and kind of how that's not quite true. However, we do have the idea that the yeah, animation is children's media. And in again, in his book, Sam Summers talks about the idea of comedy coming from incongruity. And so, um, you know, if you expect children's anim like animation to be kind of for children, like maybe, I was thinking anyway, maybe that's why when like animation is aimed at adults, that's part of where some of the humour comes from. I mean, that would make sense, right? Like yeah. some of the humour comes from the fact that like it's kind of seen as this medium for children, um, but then like a character swears or like, I don't know, Louise says something like some really dark humour, like it's like making, yeah, she says that thing about like the elect, wait, no, she says, she says it's like I'm getting to the electric chair and you're making me watch videos, videos of, of the, the electric, electric chair, chair. <laughs> like for the concert it's like oof. he talks about the idea of recognizability as also can be funny but you can need a mixture of both which again Bob's Burgers very recognizable but also you have those sort of yes yeah, again very like it has limits to this world however it's still slightly exaggerated so stuff is still like even though the fact that it's quite everyday means that the kind of more bizarre stuff becomes really, really funny. Yeah. Like the um, table setting competition, table, sorry, tablescaping competition. How oh, dare you? <laughs> because it's, 
yeah, which I think is also, I think, an intelligent decision in the beginning from them because mm. a lot of shows try to set a family in like a more unknown situation. Mm. They have a wacky job or they have very strange family dynamics to make it interesting from the beginning. Mm. Whereas Bob's Burgers is a little bit more basic in a way. Mm. Like it's two parents, three kids. It's not very extraordinary in some ways, but that means that they can play around with things and they don't have to go to yeah off the rails in order to make to something jump a shark yes yeah. absolutely <laughs> although i feel like that's something they could do and it wouldn't be that strange within that you like depending on the context like maybe they could do that so when you watch a live action um series and they do things they would do things like they do in animation you would think it looked too weird mm. you would be like well this is not believable this is just weird yeah and in animation because it's all drawn in the first place you just don't you just have an initial suspension of belief mm. So the idea of this character starting to sing and dance just doesn't seem as extreme as it would in a live action version of yeah. this. It's more possible to begin with. Yeah, because just, you yeah. just immediately, when you start watching it, you are watching drawn figures speak with voices that aren't theirs in the first place. So we wanted to talk about Tina Belcher as a millennial feminist depiction of a girl. And when we talk about feminism, I'm going to go into the different waves of feminism. This is not going to go too deep into any thing, and you don't have to have studied any history about feminism. This is just sort of it's the nice very, very basics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we talk about waves in feminism. We're probably currently in maybe the fourth or the fifth wave. Again, this is hard to establish contemporarily. Mm. Yeah, this is something you've mentioned before, that it's quite difficult to, like, kind of look at a moment that's happening now. Or even yeah. one that's, like... Like contextualizing like the 2010s from like 2021 yeah. is really hard because we just haven't had that distance to like look back and be like I don't know because it's still we're still kind of in the 2010s even though we're in 2021 like that time is sort of like you know time is not regular flat circle yeah <laughs> it's not flat circle it's well, time is not linear. It, you know, stuff like bleeds it. Like, you know, the end of the 70s was quite similar to the beginning of the 80s. Yeah. And it's like, if you tried to analyze the 70s from the 80s, like, you weren't going to be able to do a very good job because you just don't have that perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody always thinks they live in the most modern times, which isn't yeah. necessarily even true yeah, in terms of true. progression. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the first wave is usually when we talk about suffragettes, meaning voting rights and being able to sign contracts yourself. Well, and yeah. Certain women. Being, but yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's also very different in, tough, in terms of different countries because I think in England the first women we were allowed to vote were only allowed to vote from like if they had a husband and property or something yeah if yeah. they're property guess, owners yeah and they were like they always call the or odds something. yeah yeah but like the first wave is voting rights and right, right to sign contracts yourself without a husband and again this varies from country to country this varies in terms of like the time frame and I'm, also when we talk about the different waves of feminism sadly we usually talk about a very sort of western understanding mm -hmm. of feminism the second wave is 1960s 70s which was more about sexuality workplace harassment reproductive rights domestic issues such as marital rape for example and then the third wave is starting with the 1990s, sort of, but again, this is not that long ago, so it's kind of still hard to mm. contextualize a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Uh, it was more about intersectionality, sex positivity overall, vegetarian ecofeminism, trans feminism, postmodern feminism. Yeah. And then the fourth wave is more supposed to be about the focus on empowering individuals, intersectionality with more focus on internet tools to accomplish these goals. Yes. Okay, again, when I talk about ways, what I'm not saying is that there wasn't feminism in between these places or that the people who are sort of most famous for these ways mm -hmm. are the ones that did all the work. Yeah. Because, as we know in history, the most marginalized voices usually also tend to be the ones that we sort of are not taught about in history books, mm -hmm. the ones that did the groundwork, mm -hmm. that weren't talked about. When we talk about feminism, I feel like in an American context, it's usually Gloria Steinem. In, in English context, I don't remember her name. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst? <laughs> yes. Yeah. For example, those are not the only people that did stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to talk about these. And also one of the reasons why I think in terms of, a, because we live in patriarchal systems, the reason mm. these movements tend to be reduced to a person is because mm. it's very easy to get rid of a person or discredit a person, uh, but it's yes. a lot harder to get rid of a movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not that those leaders aren't very important to these movements, but es especially when we talk about the first couple waves, like yeah. feminist organizations are horribly racist and mm. horribly yeah, it was transphobic like, and still are and and just classist and yeah, because I know like some of the like early or like yeah, I think the suffragettes 
were like like women like white women should have rights because like black men are getting rights and it's yeah absolutely like, how can they have rights if we can't have rights like we should yeah. have rights they shouldn't kind of thing yeah and specifically being very very discriminatory mm. towards black women specifically, specifically like yeah. they did not see themselves as the same or seeing that this is a, like a common struggle that they both faced yeah, no, as it women was very like no it was yeah kind of aligning yourself with the whiteness like it wasn't about yes. it wasn't about like um gender it was about like we are white women like, we are white therefore we should have these rights which is why it's always very important when you hear a woman say something like i want to sort of be able to do what a man is about is uh, a white mm. man should be allowed to do mm. uh, is allowed to do the point isn't for us to be able to be as um discriminatory within this discriminatory system as high in a powerful position as white men are mm -hmm. the point is to <laughs> abolish <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in 2010s, which when I was uh, was in my 20s, was sort of the post-feminism era. It didn't start in 2010. Like I think this started pretty much in like the early, like in the mid 2000s. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But it was I very sort of this idea of um, it was celebrating the lack of need for feminism for the mm. most part, um, and it was only sort of trying to solve small problems that sort of still sometimes exist within the system. Yeah. But essentially, the the propaganda I was sort of fed growing up was. It was like fine and then the women solved it in the 60s and now it's all fine and yeah, whatever yeah exactly it's kind of brilliant in a way because any kind of complaint you brought up was sort of like well this couldn't be sexist because we don't have sexism mm. a lot of sort of the framing of it was i believe in e equality but i'm not a feminist i believe in equality but i like being married i want a family i want a husband which like no one ever like yeah, said you must yeah yeah no one ever like took your husband away from you <laughs> because someone said like you should be a feminist voting for like hillary clinton or angela merkel was always framed to be as a pro-woman statement regardless of context mm. or politics of these people yeah yeah it's so funny because it is like angela merkel is seen as such um like a feminist figure in the or like a very sort of positive figure in the uk it's like oh germany knows what they're and doing progress yeah progressive. progressive like they got their shit together which i guess yeah. in comparison to the uk it's very easy to look like that to be fair but like yeah yeah and now of... everything is compared to donald trump and boris johnson mm -hmm. you're like who isn't progressive like <laughs> compared to those two the bar is on the floor yeah yeah again like just for reference sake like angela merkel is again same-sex marriage she was pro-iraq war like this is not a progressive person she is conservative through and through mm -hmm. and it worked well internationally. People do think that it's yeah. like incredibly progressive. People really love Angela Merkel. Yeah. I don't because I live here. <laughs> <laughs> also because I'm not from a rich family. Like she doesn't do much for me <laughs> or for women in general or for sex workers or for people in marginalized groups. So the whole point was to celebrate in post-feminism was sort of celebrate women's achievements in patriarchal structures. And this is sort of how this creation of the girl boss happened. Mm. This idea of like a woman taking in power was always seen as like a positive thing. For example, bombing Middle Eastern countries, for, uh, formerly only reserved for white men, now was also something women could do. And it was like a power move, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Post-feminism framed anything that women did that helped themselves as positive. Which like, I'm not mad at any woman for doing anything for herself, but like, the idea that every single thing you do for yourself is like good for an entire movement of people mm. is kind of ridiculous. Mm. For example, are you an engineer who makes weapons that are used in dictatorships to kill thousands? Yes, queen. <laughs> this girl can. Yeah. <laughs> it was also a lot of um, appropriating of like queer, especially black language mm, yes. for like mainstream, which just as a queer person is kind of weird when people say that kind of stuff to me too. One of the ways it was sort of um, depicted was in Lean In Feminism. Lean In Feminism was, uh, Lean In was a book by uh, Sheryl Sandberg on uh, Facebook. And she, in the book, focused on putting responsibility on changing structures in the women's hands mm -hmm. by leaning in at work and not challenging the structures themselves at all, really. Mm -hmm. So reform rather than, like, radical Absolutely. Change. Absolutely. That's a very good point. And it was sort of reminding women always that in Western countries, we don't have to cover up. And, like, in other countries, women aren't allowed to, I don't know, drive or whatever. It was very Islamophobic and racist mm -hmm. because none, none of those women who wrote those type of books ever asked those women, like, what do you want to wear like no one ever sort of puts that responsibility yeah. to like in the individual's and agency yeah it becomes like the victimization narrative Absolutely. as well and it's like it's white, white savior white, white savior like white women slash men saving brown women from brown men basically yeah, yeah. especially like in germany currently it's really hard for like, hijabis and there's nothing feminist about telling someone to take off fucking clothing yeah. and you are not entitled to see anybody's body part of anything yeah. they get yeah. to choose for themselves what they want to show you and what they don't 
So Lean and Feminism, I think, was so successful in terms of media outreach mm -hmm. because it was really easy to sort of put into a capitalist structure. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it was really easy to put into a capitalist system was because selling any product could mm -hmm. be sold as an empowering move. Yes. If you remember all the like feminist t-shirts so and stuff. So many feminist t-shirts and tote yeah. bags. Yeah, this is what a feminist <laughs> looks, looks like. like. And it was really targeted for and made by white, rich, cis-head women. Mm -hmm. And the only policy that I found was sort of interesting that they put forward was this idea of deducting childcare costs from income tax, mm -hmm. which is in and of itself like a good idea, maybe first if you think about it. But then if you think about like poor women, what do they deduct mm -hmm. this from? They don't have any income. <laughs> well, like they don't have enough income. Like they're not going to get money back from the government. Sorry, that slap mosquito. was for a mosquito. Lean in feminism also in general, let's just post feminism, argued that feminism as a radical movement was not really necessary mm. and anger and rage against the system is uncalled for. Mm. It was always about sort of being critical, but like pretty, yes. like only ever do that in a pretty way. Yeah. I think this was also something that I now sort of see as like a major, even the sea lining is like a term that came up in 2014. Uh, mm. Sea lining is uh, trolling or harassment with persistent requests for evidence, repeated questions while pretending to only be interested in a civil and reasonable discussion. Mm -hmm. And because in post-feminism it was like, be nice about it. Yeah. Like you could never sort of be aggressively demanding changes. It was always sort of like, make feminism more palatable for men and stuff like mm. that, which why would I have to? Yeah. Also men, a lot of comedians were praised for any kind of positive mo notions they had on feminism and a lot of that was just like i have a daughter of course i believe in equality oh yeah i remember so much of that <gasps> which like with louis ck and people like that but like aziz ansari was praised a lot for feminism which you can read about those allegations online i'm not going to go into those and sort of being praised for like saying they're feminist or for equality or any kind of sort of support mm. for women and you can tell that that was not really coming from and i'm not saying those two dudes are the same but like it wasn't inherently something they actually believed in which yeah. is something that was sort of something that men got applauded for very easily by saying the saying very little and doing even less mm. So this goes back to <laughs> Nautina Belcher and millennial feminism. Between those uh, times, like there, again, there was definitely still like activism taking place and there was still, there's always feminism taking place because a lot of women are too marginalized not to do yeah. anything. Yeah. Like their whole existence is in within our system seen as like a political statement, so they don't really have a choice. But millennial feminism is something that sort of came after, I think, sort of post-feminism. Mm. It's not necessarily only the Me Too era, but it, I think was part of that as well. Mm -hmm. which is a different depiction of what is a girl and what is a woman meant to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can sort of say it was sort of a rejection of post-feminist culture. It was a rejection of neoliberal politics specifically. Like what I was talking about with like the capitalist structures of like selling items and you were mentioning tote bags and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was a rejection of the gender binary and of gender norms. It was a rejection of this idea that it only should be focused on women specifically and understanding that gender in and of itself is not this binary system. It was about social progressiveness and about community organizing not just electing specific individuals into mm -hmm. powerful positions but sort of doing stuff for the community it was less focused on only cis women it was also about accepting contradictions mm -hmm. and that structures are uh, allowed to and that can be absolutely fluid for you and this leads us to uh, the depiction on Bob's Burgers of Tina Belcher the one and only Tina Belcher because <laughs> Tina and Louise are both amazing characters and they're both, amazing characters yeah, they're both great but they're really really different and also it's interesting because Tina started out as a boy and then they decided that the character Daniel was actually too much like Jean so they wanted to sort of add another girl rather than mm -hmm. another uh, son they kept the glasses and changed pretty much everything else <laughs> apart from the voice actor <laughs> very true yes <laughs> they kept the same dad pen delivery which is lovely Louise is beloved by both of us yes. chaotic evil personified oh, yeah. <laughs> in the best way possible absolutely <laughs> So Tina is depicted as, I sort of grew up as a teenager as sort of, I was not like the other girls, yeah. <laughs> which is a horrible way of thinking about this. But Tina is very much depicted as a girly girl, but it's not ever depicted as a negative thing. So her interests are like horses, but uh, her personality is that she says, I'm a smart, strong, sensual woman. She also has very con contradictory traits. She tries out different personas. Like she's sometimes the bad girl. She wants to be the sweet magician's assistant to Jimmy Jr. She also tries to be a, a cool girl when the blonde girl like first comes to school. Uh, but what's her name? Tammy. Tammy? Yes. Nice. Yes, Tammy. She's so good. <laughs> but she wants to sort of try out different personas that fit her personality, but not necessarily her gender. Mm. 
Um, for example, she has her legs waxed, and then she feels sad for killing her little friends. <laughs> and she's obsessed with boys, but she's absolutely not ashamed of it. Like, the idea of, yeah. like, her being into boys is not seen as, like, a negative thing. She loves herself unconditionally. Which she's obsessed with Jimmy Jr., and she desperately wants him to, to like her, despite his behavior towards her. Again, the contradictory mm -hmm. thing. But it does always come to a point when she just gets frustrated and dates someone else or hangs yeah. out with someone else. She wants to be desired and desires herself without asking for permission. Um, her sexuality scares everybody around her, but not her. Um, she's also polyamorous, both like in her fantasy with zombies and boys. And she defines her sexuality for herself and it's not modeled after someone else's. She's also depicted with very little consumerist desires, again, which I think is, makes her a lot of uh, mm. very much like a millennial feminist depiction again. Like it's not really about clothes and makeup. Like, there's sometimes, like, episodes where she puts her beret into, like, the other side. side. Yeah, she's like, what, is it Dina? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dina now. This is not the first female teenage character we've sort of seen in cartoons. Mm -hmm. And, for example, if you remember Daria Morgendorf, Morgendorfer, sorry. She was very ironic and, like, judgmental, disinterested, bored, annoyed, and cynical. Yeah. And it was because it's, like, the same monotone. They both have glasses. Yes. They both have that very oh, monotone. Oh, good point, yeah. But, like, like... Yeah, we were talking about this before, and you were like, yeah, whereas Daria's just, like, disinterested in the world. I haven't seen Daria, but I mean, she seems quite disinterested in the world. But, like, it's, like, just, like, joyful about so many things. She's so, she's so excited to go to the boys' for now concert. Yeah, yeah, she's like, I can't wait to start remembering this night for the rest yeah. of my life. Like, yeah, she's still, she's monotone, but she's, yeah. Like, and that's kind of part of the, like, again. That's part of the comedy, Part yeah. of the comedy. It's like, she, yeah, and she's like, I've been practicing my, like, scream. Ah, that might need some work. <laughs> yeah. But also, like, Daria Morgendorfer was, I'm now just realizing this, but, like, none of the, uh, none of the Vulture kids was, like, extremely good at school. And, like, okay. Daria Morgendorfer was, like, very brilliant. She was, like, very good at school, but it was, she was just so far above it all. Ah. And she was just perfect, and she didn't really make mistakes so much mm. in the show. She wasn't really bad. And I, the only flaw that Daria had was her interest in her best friend's brother. Mm. He was, like, in a band... He didn't really do much. He didn't apply himself. Mm. Like the fact that she was interested in this boy specifically was her only flaw. Mm. You don't really have that depiction in Bob's Burgers. No. You don't have her being depicted as a negative character because she's interested in this yeah. boy or in boys in general. Yeah, and it's like because I mean, she, as a character, I guess she's very flawed in like because she, like she's not very good at school. Like she has like all these things that kind of make her a bit weird. It's not like she's like this brilliant teenager. Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of yeah. She's she's, she's very... not like a precocious like interesting like. One of a kind yeah. brain of the no, century. She's, she's very much like the other girls, but yeah. she's oh, too much like the other girls. Like, yeah. and not in a way where it's like, oh, she's too much like the other girls. But she's, you know, she goes to the like extent of like writing like friend fiction yeah. of being like really, really into like boys and like you know, there's that episode where like yeah, she goes to like the boy band convention. She just like boys for now have like lost a member and then they're like recruiting a new member. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, I'm just gonna have like one crush today. And then she's like, oh no, I've had like 20, ah. And she's, yeah, she's Every like, boy who like meets her eyes is just immediately like, <gasps> Yeah, she's like boy obsessed. Um, no, like, she's boy focused. Boy focused. <laughs> As she puts it. Someone says you're boy crazy and she says, no, I'm boy focused. <laughs> she's like the other girls to the extreme. Just one other example that I would have mm. was Lisa Simpson. Again, yeah. sort of the the A plus student always is smarter than everybody in her family, is smarter than her brother. Mm. I mean Maggie's a baby, so I don't know. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but she has sort of every kind of girly trait that Lisa Simpson has. I think is sort of treated as ridiculous and negative. Mm. Uh, there is an episode where she becomes obsessed with this heartthrob boy and it leads to her just being in sort of in this erratic state. So it's very much depicted as a negative thing that she's into this boy. Yeah. Any kind of girly traits or quote unquote feminine traits are erratic. And again, this is very much post feminism depiction because Lisa Simpson and Daria, Daria Morgan over to a degree, I think. Because mm. the idea is the more you are like a man, the more you have sort of traditional mm. male traits, it's positive. But any kind of feminine female traits, yeah. like pink or something, is like seen as negative, even yeah. though none of these things it are. It makes as... you like a weak character. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like anything feminine is. Um, expressing like a weakness and anything male expressing a strength therefore like being more like a man is like more feminist which mm. is just problematic on a thousand levels yeah. and again we're not talking about gender here in a binary way we're just saying that this is how it tends to be depicted on tv yeah and that is how i think tina belcher is a very much sort of a millennial po uh, post post feminist <laughs> depiction yeah. because she gets to be a girl and she gets to enjoy it i think one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this episode you have the, their two kind of femininities interacting 
in a way that's not like a, a massive challenge it like kind of showcases best like how their femininities aren't in competition with each other yes and very like much so. and how basically yeah within the episode like we said um, Tina's really excited to go to this concert. Louise is just like, oh, I can't bother with this. But she does help her electric sister to get Electric chair, there. she compares she it to, to the electric chair. chair. The, the first thing you see is her actually being like, okay, like, Tina, I can tell you really like this thing. We're going to get there. Like, I'm going to get you to this concert. And then... I, I, can yeah. I just read this quote? She says it. Um, it's not fun having you down, but I'm not the one who got you there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Louise, like, takes control. Yeah, she, she's brilliant. Um, but then like she's still like they get to the concert like they get there they get driven there and they're like in the car park and like there are like girls screaming and then she says um, oh God, where is it no wonder uh, no wonder no one likes women yeah it's sort of there very much sort of acknowledging that Louise is very much sort of tries to be not like the other mm. girls you see first Louise is sort of being like no I'm so above this I'm not yeah. like the other girls I'm not into boy bands yeah. and in the car um, Tina also breaks down all the different like um, boy band members and Louise is just like shut up I'm gonna shove my fist in your mouth <laughs> she just doesn't want to hear any of this she's just not interested and once Boo Boo enters the stage yes he's the fourth one that comes down <laughs> and then she just sort of immediately loses it yeah. and falls head over heels for him <laughs> and it's just so sweet and then you get Tina helping Louise um, and it's like they both have their different like strengths because it's like Louise can like take charge and like be like okay we're gonna get on our bikes we're gonna get to this concert Tina's like I have lots of experience like with crushes like I can help you through this like yes and it's that kind of so moment lovely. of like sisterly solidarity of like the, Tina's skills like her like love of boys isn't like yeah it's it's her strength rather than a weakness in this moment because she's she's like, had this experience yeah, before and she's like, yeah. I can help you through this I can be the big older sister and like help yeah. you in this time of time of need which is like a switch in this episode because usually it's Louise sort of making decisions exactly. for the kids even though she's the youngest one yeah 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 and it's it's like tina really comes into her own her own and yeah i think it's also lovely that tina doesn't judge louise i can get you through this yes <laughs> what do you like about him louise's agency is still there very much so because louise yeah. just tries to run this giant security guard and she just runs at him thinking like <laughs> i can take him <laughs> and it's like a very louise reaction to having a crush as well she's like i'm gonna slap i'm gonna slap i'm gonna slap his face <laughs> And like she kind of says like oh it's so you know get crushed like crush the crush but yeah. like that's not really like she just like enjoys like in the little after credits thing you see her like kind of slapping boo boo like <laughs> it's just so sweet it's like her way of like having a crush and it's like she can have like this like girliness but also kind of keeping her like particular kind of femininities but like she can have both she, she can have a woman can have both an eight-year-old can have both like, also the fact that this show could have made this episode about the idea that louise then becomes less like herself which it doesn't happen. Yeah. This is just another aspect of her personality. <laughs> exactly. Louise just like grows in this episode. Yeah. But she doesn't acknowledge it to her mom, which I thought was so yeah. cute. She was like, oh no, I didn't have any fun. And then she pulls out the little picture of <laughs> Boobie from her foot pillow. She's like, slap. <laughs> so cute. But what I noticed is when they get on the tour bus, Tina says, I want him to sign the inside of my <laughs> eyelids so he's, he's going to be the last because she's in a different one. She's into Griffin. Wow, that you remember that. I don't. I just remember that one of them was like 17. Oh, that was... Oh, I don't remember. Wait, I, I made notes. Yeah. Is he the one that has a wolf? No, sorry. No, no, that's Griffin. He's Griffin. super extreme. Griffin's His the hard one. His dog is a wolf. <laughs> so good. Uh, in Germany, the youth magazine was Bravo when I was a kid. And I just so see that article and the four pages of different boys and they always have different personalities. This one's dangerous. This one's cute. This one's this. Yeah. They always sort of cast them into different personalities yeah. in these yeah. boy bands. <laughs> but just, I just, I can see in Bravo, his dog is a the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because when she says, um, I want Griffin to sign the inside of my eyelid so it'll be the last thing I see before I fall asleep. And then Louise ends up being the one that has like the last like the last thing she sees before he falls asleep. The last thing she does is slap with his face. face. Oh, <laughs> I hadn't put that together. I saw your notes and I was like, what do you mean this is what Louise becomes? Like, yeah. it's like no, yeah, because oh. Louise sort of becomes the fangirl that Tina talks about. Sorry, slaps. <laughs> Fuck those mosquitoes. Do you want to talk about boy bands? Yeah, or... I think now is a good time to talk to bring in our pre-read text element. Hooray! <laughs> yes, absolutely. Our title does make sense. We're <laughs> going to carry this through. So yeah, for anyone who hasn't listened to another episode of our podcast or just needs a bit of reminding, well, wonders why we are called the pre-read media take. Yes, pre-read media. Media take just means any kind of media library. Yeah. Oh yeah, we haven't. Did we talk about that? No. Before? Oh, yeah, it's a German term because we are a 
a, a, an international podcast, German and English. Yeah. Um, Both within the EU and outside of the EU. <laughs> yeah, basically just a pre-read text is um, a kind of piece of media where you have an idea about it. You kind of like feel like you know what it's about. Like, you know, characters, you know, themes, you know, a storyline or whatever, images. But you've never actually seen the thing or, or you've seen adaptations of the thing. It's about like... It's idea of like kind of pre-read, like before you've seen it, you think you know what it's about. This term was coined by Rowan Ellis, and I think in her video, so yeah, Rowan Ellis, a YouTuber, in her video she talks kind of more specifically about pre-read text as like kind of very specific pieces of like classic media, like um, yeah. Sherlock Holmes or Treasure Island or something like that. But I think, I mean, she also talks about like dramaturgy and like the idea of, yeah, like kind of audience preconceptions of something and how like that's impacted by so many different things, which is kind of what we're taking this term to be. So, um, yeah. It's just so this the whole the episode opens with um their song Coal Mine. Oh yeah it does. I was like what was the what was she referencing with the electric chair? That was the electric chair. That was the electric Beautiful chair. Beautiful song. <laughs> it's so I just like lo I like died like op in the opening of that um episode. Because yeah, it's just like this exaggerated like cheesiness of like um boy band songs like you know <laughs> the auto tune, it's just the, the metaphor, like the kind of overarching metaphor of like will you be mine? Coal oh mine. <laughs> it's just the, the most awful pun, and it's so <laughs> funny. And they're just like, it's just like mine. It doesn't even rhyme when they like break will into the girls' room. They say like, <laughs> they go like, "Will you be mine?" And then it just goes like, "Diamond." And you're like, "What?" That doesn't even rhyme with coal mine. <laughs> but mine, mine rhymes. With, it's, yeah, it's just. It's, <laughs> It's like amazing, it's awful, it's amazing. And it's just like mining is such an inappropriate sort of like it just it's they like, cough in it and you're yeah, like <laughs> Yeah, I know, it's just like so it's just the comedy of it is so inappropriate. It's like mining's <laughs> a very dangerous like profession. Yeah. Like yeah, it's like oh lol like miner's lung. It's like what why is this like a cheesy pop song for <laughs> tweens? Like what is this? And it's oh god, it's just yeah, it's just fantastic. It's but, a beautiful song, highly recommended. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it kind of boy bands the pre-read text. What makes it funny is your your understanding of the manufacturing, the like the auto tune, the terrible like puns and the metaphors and all that stuff. The choreography. The choreo or oh, the little like step <laughs> and like hand step hands and oh uh, and it's like my hat is hard but my car is soft like that kind of. Just, oh, God. I also it always reminds me of that Bo Burnham song that he wrote about like the Justin Bieber's of this world. Oh uh, yeah. It was sort of this thing of like, I love how um, he sort of wrote this sort of satire song about how these songs was written that every girl can think it's about them. Oh yeah. And so it's like the lines in the Bo Burnham song are like, I love how your torso has an arm on either side of it. <laughs> and I love your, your <laughs> eyes. <laughs> yeah. And, oh. and it's like Tina's delivery as well at like the deadpan, like his dog is a wolf. <laughs> stop. And then yeah, Louise is just like, stop. <laughs> And it's like we are both Louise and Tina at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> also, one of them is comically meant to be like, a lot older than he's sort of allowed to be. And Louise says, like, maybe the mustache is 17, but the guy is 90. <laughs> Which I love because it was, again, allowing like a young girl in a show to be a young girl because any kind of adult when you're that young is just gross. Oh, yeah. So, and they like, seem so old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember like being about, I don't know, must have been like six. No, maybe like seven or eight. Yeah, about seven or eight. And seeing like people, like literally kids that are about like 10 or like 11 and being like, they seem like, I just remember them seeming like teenagers, like really old teenagers, like yeah. 19. And it's like these children are like 11. <laughs> but like, I think it is genuinely when you're small, everyone just seems so old. Like any, anyone who's like slightly older than you seems just, yeah, yeah, ancient. That's, I think, one of the reasons I was not really into One Direction. Mm. Because I know, I think most of them are like a year or two younger than me. And that just uh, felt so yeah. gross to me at the time when they sort of got famous. Mm -hmm. Was no, that's a child, gross. And the idea of boys my age always seemed incredibly immature. So the idea of being into someone who was younger than me was very strange yeah, to me. Yeah, that's so interesting. I like never got really into, like I never got into One Direction. Although I did watch their season of The X Factor, and I watched them lose. Like I watched them lose The X Factor. I always forget that they were on the one of those shows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because like everybody watched X Factor. Like when I was at school, everyone watched X Factor, and so I was kind of more into like JLS um, as a band. Like I wasn't really into them as like I never got massively into like oh this member's this, this member's this. Like I didn't know all their names. I was like you weren't into the cute one. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, like, so because I went, it also yeah. meant something about your personality as a girl, as, mm, as far as I like remember. Which one you're like, into. Yeah. And there was always one that, like, you know, was the most popular one, which is... So I went yeah. to a JLS concert <laughs> with some friends. Oh, and, you did? Yes. And nice. it was really, really good. Like, I had su- <laughs> that was my first concert and I had such a good time. And, like, I, when I'm saying, like, oh, I wasn't really into them as members, like, I'm not saying that to diss it. Like, I reckon that would have been really fun, like, if yeah. I had been. But I just wasn't, like... I, I We listened to their music a lot at school, but, like, I wasn't really, really into them. Um, but like when we went, I went for like a friend's birthday and each of us like had to, because there were like four members and there were four of us, and it was like each of us had to have our own separate one. And so I was just like assigned one. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about like, if I like that one, you don't get to like yeah, that one. No, it was like, oh no, my God, Aston's it was so territorial. Like, Aston is mine, and so you get to have these ones. It's like, okay, I, I really don't care, but like, sure. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, like he's the cute, okay, like that's the best one, you get the best one, sure. Like it's your birthday, you get that one. It's like, what does this mean? And we made like a poster, which was really, again, and we had so shirts. Nice. And it was, yeah. See, oh, this is all nice. I miss about being while I was being not like the other girls because my mm. generation especially in Germany was like Broses and No Angels mm. and Broses was like not a boy band it was like I think two women and four men or three mm-hmm. and No Angels was completely just a girl group mm-hmm. but just I was sort of I very much listened to this music constantly but if you would have asked me I would have never acknowledged that I did and I if I, I would have loved to have gone to a concert, but I would have never wanted to acknowledge that because yeah. that would have made me like uncool. I mean, honestly, I was which similar. is so stupid. Like it's yeah. just such a waste of time. I know, and it's so much fun. I was like, yeah. I had such a good time, and I only went because somebody else was really into them. And I mean, it was a little bit like it was a little bit like, okay, like I'm sorry, I don't know this band as well as you do, but like it was still a really good. Like I really enjoyed that concert. Also, I knew all the songs, and they did nice. like an encore, and I was like, I didn't know what an encore <laughs> was at the time, really, and I was like, oh, they're coming back on stage, yay! And it was yeah, it's it not was, over yet. <laughs> it was really fun. I just had such a good time. It was, was such really a weird like age, age like uh, generationally because I was a little bit too young for NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. Oh yeah. I feel like those were sort of like before me in a way, mm. like kids who were sort of when I think in the late eighties were more into those. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't. So to to me, they were more like on the older side. I don't really want to do with those. Really, my thing. And then I can. I was too ah. old for Justin Bieber and old. So you too just old like for... missed just slightly the wrong generation. I mean, there like... must have been some though. I feel like Tokyo Tokyo Hotel was. I mean, there wasn't a boy band. There was a band. I was never into talk, Tokyo Hotel either because I think like thirteen year olds were into Tokyo Hotel when I was like fifteen. Sorry, slap, slap. Slap. Fucking die. <laughs> <laughs> so aggressive. I love the fact you said that thing about this, uh, the encores because in the show. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, they've done eight encores. They usually only do seven. Like, which, again, I didn't know like, that was like a part of the whole thing. Apparently, that's like a normal thing. Yeah, then? you usually have like one or two encores. Like, if you're okay. lucky, I think there were two encores actually at the JLS one, which is what I wasn't expecting. It was like, oh, another song. <laughs> Hooray! Yeah, oh, it's so funny. And I was like, yes, this is like the kind of going to a boy band concert experience. Nice. It's really fun. Because we watch a couple of like old boy band videos for this episode. <laughs> and I showed her, again, this was something that I wasn't really into because I, again, because I wasn't allowed to watch TV. Also, this was like pre-streaming internet. I couldn't just watch the music videos over and over if I didn't have access to a TV and I didn't. So I didn't really get into them. But I showed her one video of Us Five, which was like this German-American sort of constructed boy band, yeah. which didn't last very long as far as I remember. Would you consider Jonas Brothers a boy, uh, a boy group? Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, I don't think I've listened to that much. They weren't really something I was into. I think, were they like Disney Channel kind of thing? I feel like they were on Disney Channel or something. Yeah, they were in a wonderful movie that we need to like review at some point called Camp Rock. Oh, I have seen Camp Rock actually. <laughs> I did really like Camp Rock. Again, Jonas Brothers, first album they ever brought out, the most mainstream one, I bought, never acknowledged it to anybody else. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Just so much time wasted in trying not to be like the other I girls, know. honestly. What are we doing? Yeah. 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 But again, one of the reasons we brought this up is because this is not a new phenomenon. Like boy bands come like the monkeys is like a really old one. Yeah. The Beatles. Yes. The idea of having like favorite member, the idea of these personas being very constructed within sort of the way that they are sold. That's mm-hmm. already very intentional because you're trying to sort of break up this market of teenage girls because they are willing to spend a lot of money yeah. on you. Oh no, it's so true. It's like if you, you can market them, it's all about marketing. Yeah, That's why they marketing. all have different... Oh, yeah, yeah of course. So, yeah, that, of course. That, because actually, otherwise course. you would buy one poster. It's the whole like Team Edward, Team Jacob. Like, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, yeah, Twilight. All, 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 all movie discussions always, all media discussions always lead to Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> Of course. Yeah. We said uh, Griffin's sort of described as the hard one. Ellen is shy but sweet. His fans are called Alan Coholics. 
Aww. Matt is moody and a little older. He's 90. <laughs> He's not 90. Um, but Boo Boo is the young and crazy good at dancing. Oh, and I know, and I remember like when she's talking about Boo Boo in like when they're in the concert, she's like, oh, he's got a great voice, but he hasn't hit puberty yet, so that could change. <laughs> and that's like so. Oh, that's also a. Co that's like. Again, that's like a self referential, like very aware of the idea of. Yeah, like. Because that's what happens quite a lot with like child stars and like yeah. child singers is like like Justin Bieber everyone was like oh he hasn't hit puberty yet and then he made his comeback anyway but like yeah yeah Ugh, yeah I think to bring this back to the Shrek reading yeah. it's kind of intertextuality and because you have that a pre con you you have that pre-read text the pre-read text of boy bands yeah. when they play on these things it breaks the fourth wall it kind of draws you out of the illusion because you're aware of the joke. And it's kind of intertextual, and that's what makes it really, really funny. And it comes from the depiction, it comes from the hair swoop, it's very Justin Bieber like hair, especially oh, yeah. with Boo Boo. Boo it's also the music. It's very, very catchy songs that are very easy to remember. Yeah, yeah. and just, oh, just so good. <laughs> yeah, and okay, and also one of the really nice things that we were talking about before was the fact that this boy band, they're so wholesome and they're so like, it's, you know, all their songs are about, like, they have that song that's about, um, like, I want to know your secrets, I'm so interested in you. Yeah. It's all about, like, being really, really interested in, like, their fans and in, like, the girls that, like, love them. Yeah. And, but then, um... I feel like on The Simpsons, the storyline would have been, you just get backstage and they're doing coke or something. Yeah, and they're assholes and they're, yeah. like, horrible. But actually, yeah, you get into the tour bus and, like, kind of, you know, it's like, no fans are around, they're hiding in the hamper and they're, like... We made a lot of girls smile tonight. We or cast a lot of smiles. We cast a lot of smiles tonight. And it's like it's so aww. adorable. And then like Booby's like, I want to like when they find Louise and Tina, he's like, I want to talk to like I'm trying to talk to a fan. Yeah, yeah. It's like so respectful, and it's like, yeah. oh wait, that off like um, screen personas are like the same yeah. as their on screen. Like, they're just so like it's like oh they actually they really care about like yeah. their fans. It's a very sort of positive depiction of this yeah. type of thing. Like it's not sort of this, I don't know, celebrity who's over it and just mm. being a dick to like everybody to like the bus driver or something yeah. also they sing a song to get boo boo into his booster seat it's like from your big boy head to your big, big boy, boy feet <laughs> and he wants to get out of it so he can he's very embarrassed of being in the booster seat in front of a girl yeah he says can i help you little girl or like what do you I want know. little girl and it's so respectful and what? yeah it's so respectful and nice often it's that whole like kind of culture of celebrity and like the way industries work like that dynamic isn't Often people are quite awful towards their fans, but it's that power dynamic of being like having that much power over fans. Yeah. Um, also, given like boy bands in general, just celebrity, like male celebrities mm -hmm. specifically, yeah. there's just a lot of abuse of sort of that hierarchy and power dynamics with fans. Yeah. And that just not respecting the line that this is still the person you're like talking to as a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what kind of power you have over someone when they're obsessed with you. Yeah. Yeah. It's like not even like, yes, definitely with children as well, and then like with older fans, because you are like the celebrity. Um, and you just have more power in that situation in general yeah. and that there are still very very much lines that both of these people need to respect the fact that Tina fights in the hamper and <laughs> that's one of the things that I find a little bit problematic mm. sometimes on the show that she does sneak into like boys locker rooms yeah and, and like she that. like looks through the like crack yeah. in the wall or whatever and you're like that's kind of crossing a bit of a line here and it's like it's shown as fine because she's just like a teenage girl but like yeah. It's sort of shown as like being very innocent, but like the boys themselves are not respected in that moment mm. then. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. this, it's also played for laughs. Like at one point, someone goes, those practices are closed and she goes, I know, Seek, I'm the reason they're closed. Mm. Funny, but ooh. Yeah. 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 She would respect mm. those people's boundaries. She has no business being there. Mm -hmm. Not going back into the power dynamics of it, but it is kind of sad when I watch the episode. <laughs> I realized watching the outro in its fullness and because he says I'm so interested in you and so interested in you but the sad part is I think also one of the reasons why boy bands are so yeah. successful I don't know that boys are into girl bands that deeply just mm. as a phenomenon like in the mainstream and it's kind of sad that they aren't mm. and they should absolutely just go for that but I think one of the reasons why boy bands are so successful with girls is because it's the first time someone who isn't related to you who's sort of your age is interested in your life like or at least seems to be mm -hmm. again this idea of i'm so interested in you i want to know every detail <laughs> what size are your shoes <laughs> that's such a good line <laughs> but like it's the first time someone's actually not interested bragging that they've held your hand or that they've kissed you or whatever yeah it's someone who actually wants to know about you yeah it's like kind of very it's not like we we when we were looking at kind of different pictures of like kind of boy bands and stuff and it's like it go, kind of goes from sort of like very kind of like hyper muscular to sort of like more kind of like 
less muscular but kind of like more defined muscles maybe but like yeah that, less big that shift, less threatening less big to kind of more like kind of soft boy almost like yeah yeah and it's sort of like that shift from like the kind of very like hyper masculine male gaze to like a more sort of like kind of teen girl female gaze and it's like what do teen girls want it's not like because you don't want someone who is physically capable of breaking you in half when yeah. you're 13 no and it's <laughs> what you want is like because there's so you know so much of sort of like het relationships is like men not listening to women or like being unattended yeah. like so much there's that kind of trope of like you know oh he just doesn't listen to me he doesn't really care he won't say I love you or whatever yeah. and it's like this like the boy band kind of fulfills that niche of like oh no he's really interested in you and he's they're like, doing all the emotional labour yeah yeah <laughs> And you just want people to be, because you're like a kid and you're like, I want someone to like care about me. And yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, just, yeah. And it's kind of sad. Not to like but, belittle that, but it's yeah. just so sad that that's like a phenomenon that capitalism has found a way to fill. Oh, true. Yeah. Yeah. Just. <laughs> the fact that Louise is sort of getting into this sphere of her personality is shown as a positive thing. It's also in the outro. And Louise starts to dance and then her dad looks back and then she stops for a second and then Aww. she's like, oh, whatever. And then she keeps dancing to the beat, but you get to see her such a... Yeah. She's not doing this ironically. This is not like a hipster thing. Mm. And slaps him doing it as well. I know, it's so <laughs> awesome. It's so sweet. I love when she like jumps with her arms. Yeah. It's so cute. Oh to the beat. It's so cute. We do need to talk about the lyrics because I just, again, this is a boy band thing. I just love the fact that they talk about, like, let me whisper in your eyes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's just, I get, yeah. That's so gross, too. And if you listen to the whole song, it's just like, your mouth eyes, no, your ear eyes, it just keeps talking. It's just like you can hear and get, like, progressively, like, more lost in this metaphor, and it's like, uh, this doesn't make any sense anymore. We're gonna keep going anyway. Tell me about every single time you've cried. Oh, when your goldfish died. <laughs> just so lovely. Oh, yeah. When they're down in the mine, also they're saying, I know I'm breathing toxins, but you're looking foxin. <laughs> Will you be mine? Oh my. Ah, I felt that. Ow. Yikes. Sorry. Mosquitoes are really brazen, honestly. Foxen. Sorry. I know I'm breathing toxins, but you're looking foxin. <laughs> Will you be mine? Coal oh mine. <laughs> Go from. Oh, no wonder and no one likes women. Mm. But she goes from that just completely falling into the same tropes that she desperately doesn't want to yeah. um, fulfill. And she like finds, depict. Yes. When she slaps the picture, she doesn't slap. It shows so, so it's soft. Slap, like it was so tender. Yeah. It's still a slap, but it's so tender and she's so happy. And the way Kristen Shaw also says it's like, slap. <laughs> so cute. So cute. I just no, really no. enjoyed talking about this episode. I really, really enjoyed this. Yes. And I'm very grateful to everybody who put Tina Belcher as a feminist depiction on mm. Tumblr a thousand times. Because it is a reason I started watching it. Looking for something new to watch. And this, I'm sure, is not the last Bob's Burgers episode we covered. Oh, because it was just so fun to also research a little bit and just enjoy the episode over and over. Okay, so you can find yeah. us at Liliana Pod on Twitter. Yeah, please subscribe. Yes, please. Join us. Um, oh yeah, tell us your favorite boy band. Or oh yes, Tell us a boy please. band that you were really into or are really into. Yeah, or a song that you think maybe we haven't really checked out because we're different generation or just from different countries maybe. Yeah. Is because since like... they're like German boy bands, there must be like, I don't know, Turkish ones or yeah. just from different countries, please. Yeah, there must be. Yes, yes. Or like, what did your country have that wasn't like a boy? Like, was there anything else that filled that niche? Like, yeah. let us know. <laughs> really interested. I'm really interested to find out. Yeah. Um, Always happy for any music recommendation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Find us on Instagram at LilianaPod as well. Also on Twitter. Yeah. So we can be found on Instagram and on Twitter as LilianaPod, meaning L I L I and then A N N A, like the two names, and then yeah. just P O D. It's just four letters. Yes. Like, in total. That's <laughs> all you need to remember, then P O D. Yeah. Um, and you can, and you can email us at Liliana's Pre-Read Media Tech at hotmail dot com. Well, yeah. So we end usually end the show by giving a little recommendation of what we something we've been enjoying a piece of media. Anna, yes. What is your recommendation? Because we were talking about animation, I was thinking about Tuka and Birdie, which is a very good. <gasps> I love good... Tuka and Birdie. You do? We've never talked about this before. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I swear we men think maybe it was someone else I was talking to this talking to I don't think we've this. ever talked about Tuka and Birdie. I just love it so much. 
it's Ali Wong and Tiffany Haddish, and it's it's brilliant writing. It's beautifully animated, and it covers everything you can possibly think of in terms of animation that usually doesn't get covered. Yeah, it's like kind of very focused on like female friendship. Yes, and it's really really good, and it's by the people who made BoJack Horseman. Oh really? Yes, and I it's really it's really different. I mean, it's sort of I guess similar in that it's sort of adult animation. It's about kind of like adult issues but yeah. like very i do really like bojack horseman but it is really hard to watch like i couldn't i actually didn't I quite cannot, finish it i didn't I finish the last that. episode no i know yeah. everybody says it's brilliant but every time i try to watch it i get depressed honestly for yeah. like a day yeah literally it's, yeah <laughs> it's you need a break like i was talking to one of our flatmates about it he was like yeah i just need to break after finishing that last season like it's just like, whew, like yeah it's it's really really good but yeah it's very yeah. depressing and also like sometimes just the second hand like I couldn't finish it because of the second hand embarrassment there was just too much cringe in that last episode and I was oh just dear. like don't make this terrible decision please no also Chuck and Birdie was I think one season Netflix and then they cancelled it saying it just didn't get enough views or something because they failed with the al the algorithm messed up I think oh really yes I think that's I what I didn't happens. read about that it wasn't because it wasn't a popular show it was because I they watched didn't it in one day and then it was cancelled so quickly yeah, and then I was like I what just that, like but it got picked up again that's what I'm saying like please let's yes. support uh, think, like the new I think adults no uh, they're not adults when I crap. need something I can't remember we We're gonna put it in, put the, it in the notes, yeah. yeah. But I think they, yeah, they. It, the Again, seasons, because I'm in a different oh. country, it just is usually available on different things. I think like Bob's Burgers is available in Germany on Disney Plus through Star, not even through oh, Fox. Is it like through it's, Star? It's oh, not so stars. weird. Star. Star or is stars? Is it called Stars? Is it Stars like as in Black the channel? Stars? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like okay, it's very yeah. odd. Like uh, in terms of like the. That's mm -hmm. why I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. What's your recommendation, Lily? My recommendation is actually a song that I think is quite, I think it's probably in the, I don't really know the charts, but I think it's probably in like indie charts or something like that. Yeah. It's called Chase Long um, by Wet Leg. Basically, my dad sent it to me like via me Facebook Messenger and <laughs> I listened to it and I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. Like, thanks for this. Like, I like I appreciate it because he likes to send me music sometimes and I really appreciate it. It's so nice. It. I know. Yeah, he's really sweet. Um, and. I kind of listened to it and I didn't think it was great, but I was like, this is, you know, fine. This is like a nice song. And I think it like marinated, you know, when that song just like marinates yeah. in your brain. And then I was just like on like Apple music and just like went onto their like radio channel, whatever. And it was playing. And I was like, what is this song? Like, yes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's the song my dad sent me. And I was just like, okay, I get it now. Like I get it. And it's really, really good. And I've just been listening to it on repeat basically. Oh, nice. I yeah. want to check that out then. I have no idea. Apparently they just, like I heard a little bit of like what they were saying about the band. Like they were just debuting before COVID hit. They did like a concert in the Isle of Wight or something, or they were like playing in the Isle of Wight and then COVID happened. Yeah. Everything um, shifted. Yeah. Everything shifted. But yeah, yeah I recommend that. Yeah. Also, Lily, um, what is a German boy band called that plays classical stuff? Oh, I don't know, Anna. What is a German boy band called that plays ca classical stuff? The Bach Street Boys. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's really... I'm using that one. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note. Yeah. See ya. See ya. Bye. Bye.